They say the forty gallant vultures there was in the maze. They dropped and beat the tactics when the number it was less. In her essay, Diana and Nikon, Janet Malcolm wrote about a toy camera called the Diana compared to a more expensive and professional camera, the Nikon. For Malcolm, photographs made by both machines were equal in terms of expression, if not in technical clarity. She wrote, The dreary, gray, blurred little pictures taken with the $1.50 toy camera called the Diana look like the dreary, gray, blurred little pictures that children briefly take with the toy cameras they get for Christmas before turning to more gratifying pastimes. They also look like the works of avant-garde art. Photography, perhaps more readily than any other medium, complies with the Duchampian dictate. If I call it art, it becomes art, whereby a urinal assumes the stature of a work of sculpture. The dullest, most inept, and inconsequential snapshot, when isolated, framed on a wall or by the margins of a book, and paid attention to, takes on all the uncanny significance, fascination, and beauty of our mutt's fountain, or the bicycle wheel, or the bottle rack. This praise for the power of a toy camera to reveal exquisite detail in a casually captured image reminds me of Percy Granger's description of his use of the phonograph in collecting folk song. To our modern ears, accustomed to wide dynamic range heard in digital audio, Granger's cylinder recordings of Joseph Taylor and others singing English folk songs in the first decade of the 20th century sound like scratchy, frail wails of ghosts calling from a foggy, distant past. They say the forty-gallon vultures there was in the maze. They dropped and beat the tactics when the number it was less. Granger, however, wrote in a 1908 article, Collecting with the Phonograph, about the subtleties of pitch, rhythm, and other nuances that could not be notated conventionally, but could be appreciated in his recordings. In both simple photographs and primitive audio recordings, the objectification of detail produced by mechanical recording, visual or sound, affords the reviewer opportunities to see or hear micro-events that could not be discerned at the moments of capture. These low-resolution artworks challenge polarities of cultivated and vernacular, high and low, good and bad. Their imperfections demand close observation, drawing the observer into a microcosmos of delicate beauty. I am not aware of articulations of any thoughts that Percy Granger may have had about the photographic medium as a conveyor of expression, but the pictures he took are collected in various archives, including the Granger Museum in Melbourne, Australia, as well as the Granger House Museum in White Plains, New York. Robert Simon's Percy Granger, The Pictorial Biography, is an excellent source for viewing a substantial number of them. Granger's images reveal something of his personal style as evidenced in his piano recordings, his writings, his drawings, and above all, in his compositions and arrangements. To my eyes, his photographs are full of forthright expressions of wistfulness, sentimentality, pain, and most conspicuously, physicality, that can be felt while listening to his music. Although Janet Malcolm's postmodern assessment of the camera as a leveler of elitist values in art was made in the decades following Granger's death, his pictures suggest that he might have agreed with Malcolm's view of photography as a democratic medium. As in his music, indeed, as in his life, what matters in one of Granger's photographs is not so much the subject or even less perfection of technique. Rather, it is the intensity of feeling expressed that is paramount. Sometime in the 1920s, before November 1926, when he made his first solo tour to Australia, Granger obtained a new Kodak 3A Autographic Junior camera as an upgrade to his box Brownie. The 3A had many advantages over the Brownie. While, like the Brownie, it had a simple, single-element meniscus lens, the 3A used a larger film size that afforded more picture detail, and the shutter offered the operator more control over aperture and speed than the Brownie. The resultant higher quality probably mattered to Granger. He occasionally used the camera to produce images for a publication that the Brownie could not have managed. The main trade-off was size. 
at nine and a half by four and three quarters by eight and a half inches in operating position, the folding pocket size 3A was a large, heavy beast. Nevertheless, Granger found room in his luggage for the camera on many of his trips between 1926 and at least 1947. He recorded his travels with it, six frames per roll, and entered information about the negatives into an index before shipping the camera and all of the prints made from the negatives to the Granger Museum in Melbourne. Most of the negatives and some of the duplicate prints made with the 3A are in the collection at the Granger House Museum in White Plains. Oh, <laughs> 